All right, well, good evening. Here we are for our last webinar on this topic of human sexuality in the church. Uh, we'll take a week off and come back uh, March uh, 14th for another webinar series on uh, fasting from things during Lent. Uh, what's the history of Lent? And uh, why do we give up things? And what should we give up and put in its place? It's going to be interesting and you don't want to miss it. Uh, another reminder uh, to start asking us questions by clicking the question button below us uh, so we can tackle those when we're done sharing our information. And that's only going to be on Crowdcast. If you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, you got to log in uh, to uh, Crowdcast. That's how we're seeing the questions. Uh, and click on the follow button if you want to be notified. It's over here. Yeah, if you want to be notified and reminded uh, when our uh, Lenten webinar begins. All right, so I want to begin with a trigger warning. Uh, if you've ever been the victim of sexual abuse or assault as, as a minor or as an adult, this might be a difficult webinar for you. So please don't watch it uh, unless you have a support network, someone to reach out to if necessary. All right, so we're going to start by talking about the Me Too movement, which is important because for hundreds, if not thousands of years, women's bodies have been objectified, owned, and assaulted by those trying to exert power um, or dominance. So even today, they estimate that one in four women will be assaulted in their lifetime. And I was assaulted when I was 17. So this is a really personal issue for me as well. Uh, Tarana Burke started using the phrase Me Too as early as 2006, and it came back again uh, in the wake of the Weinstein scandal when Alyssa Milano tweeted it in uh, 2017. So 4.7 million people uh, in 12 million posts within the first 24 hours of Alyssa Milano using this hashtag used it themselves to describe their own experiences. I mean, that's huge. Um, so we need to see the, the Me Too movement that has had a steady presence in the film and music industry extend to the church as well. So just a month after Alyssa Milano used the Me Too hashtag, um, there was another hashtag called Church Too that was introduced. And in January of 2018, uh, another one, Silence is Not Spiritual, was used to call out how churches handle sexual abuse. Yeah, I've witnessed uh, women being uh, treated very differently than men. Uh, going through the process of being ordained as pastors, they asked me questions uh, relevant to ordination. And with the same interviewing team, Rachel was asked how she was going to handle kids and ministry. Mm. Not me. Uh, why didn't they ask uh, me that? Um, why only ask Rachel? Uh we left the West Ohio conference uh, because we returned from the Peace Corps. They encouraged Rachel to go into Christian ministry uh, mm -hmm. so that she could support me in my ministry. I didn't like that, and she didn't like that uh, because I knew that she was called into ordained ministry. And I thought that was the most ridiculous suggestion imaginable. He's right. So from the first initial step into the ordination process, and I have to say, I mean, I feel blessed to at least be in a denomination that does ordain women because there are not too many of those out there. But from my very first step until I was fully ordained eight years later, I faced opposition, um, maybe because I'm an assertive vocal leader, no, which would make me a stellar candidate for ministry if I were a man. But as a woman, people had concerns. Uh, at first, I was a little intimidated to stand up for myself because I didn't want to come across as defensive or combative. But I learned how to use my womanhood and motherhood as a shield uh, by the end of my process. So one of my favorite stories about um, not necessarily sexual abuse, but just discrimination in mm -hmm. the church and how people jump to assumptions and don't even realize it, that they're mistreating women. Um, so I was sitting before the Board of Ordain Ministry, and there was this one committee that had to determine whether or not I had appropriate self-care. And the board asked me how on earth I could prove I had healthy self-care when I had a two-year-old and an infant and was planting a church. You know, I'm a young mother. And I can't, I couldn't move forward in the process unless I could prove that I was properly taking care of myself. Um, my husband wasn't asked that question, but my response to the board of all predominantly men, uh, males was, 
Well, my infant daughter has refused a bottle no matter how hard I've tried. So that means I am the only source of life she has right now through nursing. And my daughter will starve to death and die if I'm not rested, hydrated, and calm enough to produce enough milk to feed her. I have to sit down every few hours, take a break from work to hold my beautiful baby girl. Have you seen my chubby little girl? She is doing just fine. And I highly doubt that any of you are sustaining life with your self-care in a way that can be visibly seen. So don't question me. I'm doing just fine. Thank you. The board approved me for ministry. Mic drop. <laughs> I'll never forget uh, being in the beginning of our ministry when uh, she came back from a meeting and told me about um, this young man uh, who was mistreating her and kind of saying some things that uh, I didn't like. And um, and uh, I wanted to go after him. Uh, so when, it, when I happened to run into him at a mission event, uh, I shook his hand really hard. For an awkwardly long time, just to let him know I was unhappy. And so uh, later when I told Rachel about what I had done, feeling all proud, and I'm the man, I'm your man, uh, she told me not to do that ever again. Mm -hmm. She had to fight her own battles. Uh, so for me, in the Me Too movement, I learned that the best thing for me to do as a man, as a husband who wants to protect my wife and to go after those who hurt her or even my daughter or any, anybody like that is to, is to let her, my wife, fight her battles with these people. Because unless, uh, unless she asks me to step in and, um, and the best thing for me to do uh, is to be me, um, a strong confident man who's not threatened or intimidated at all by being married to a strong, uh, confident, and uh, leader woman. Uh, when people meet Rachel, they wonder what kind of uh, mouse of a man uh, that she married. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've been around that. They're like, okay, what's this little guy going to be like? And when they, when I come in the door, all 6'3", 230 pounds uh, of all of me, all Appalachian American me, uh, they realize nobody pushes me around, uh, and that changes, that changes their perception of a woman in leadership. A lot of times people think that a strong, uh, strong women have to have doormats of a husband or a boyfriend, and I think strong women have to have strong husbands because like attracts like. So for me, I want to find my own way to address hurdles that come because of my gender. But there are times when men or women speaking up for the person being attacked or assaulted is crucial. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 31.8 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. So the more comfortable we become with naming sexism, gender bias in our culture, in our churches, the less power these evils have over us. And it doesn't have to be done in a vindictive way. You can say, wow, that sure sounded like a sexist remark. Or I wonder why you think it's okay to talk to someone like that. Oh, wow, you're being a white male, aren't you? That's what I get said. You say that, oh, yeah. No, you tell me. <laughs> okay, that. and the more influence and age you have under your belt, the more you need to speak the truth to power. So I was just reading the news today and saw a story about an actress that stepped out of a contract to do an animated film because the animation chief she would be working with had a record of mistreating women for decades. This actress has enough fame and enough power and fortune that she can speak up for women who might feel trapped, like they have to work for a man like this. And so hopefully her decision will enact change and protect more women. Something else that helped me um, was taking a self-defense class after being a victim of sexual assault. So I felt empowered to stand up if my body was threatened in any way. So look around, find a course to take, invite some friends to join you. Um, I know if you're here local in Hampton Roads, Brett Thompson has done courses for us at the church and for realtors uh, with his jujitsu experience. So opportunities are out there, really great ones. All right, so we're going to move from the Me Too movement, uh, which is um, a sexuality issue about how men, and it's usually men, 99.9% .9 of the time, men mistreating mm -hmm. women. Uh, we must see everybody as created in the image of God. If we see everybody that way, we must treat them with that love and that respect and to treat women 
Uh, less than that, which is what the Me Too movement is really all about, is not what God wants for us. But as fallen and sinful human beings, we distort all sorts of things, uh, how we treat women and how some people uh, can treat treat children. Um, the Catholic Church and the Baptist churches are, are getting a lot of press uh, these days about sexual abuse uh, in the church uh, inflicted by spiritual leaders. Uh, within the last week, CBS reported that over 2,600 priests, 2,600 priests and church workers over the past few decades have abuse allegations. But this abuse isn't just happening in the Catholic and the Baptist church. It's mm-hmm. happening in all churches, all denominations, uh, at all levels of authority. Mainly it's in the local church. And later on, the pastor of the local church rises to a higher authority. And that's when they're being reported. And, and that's why you'll have bishops and higher ranking uh, people uh, brought up on uh, sex abuse uh, charges. Uh, it's happening in the church offices. It's happening in youth groups. It's happening in the choir and convents with nuns. And it's happening to women, men, and children. When I hear stories about nuns being raped, giving birth to the children of priests, or I read about pastors and priests molesting children, and those kids have to carry that shame and that pain their entire lives, my heart just breaks. You know, as a survivor of sexual assault, I needed counseling to heal and have a healthy view of my own sexuality, but my assault wasn't affiliated with the church at all. For those who are victimized in the house of God, they have to heal not just physically and emotionally, but spiritually as well. Because how could a good God allow such a horrible thing to happen in God's house? The short answer is we don't know why God allows it. We do know God isn't the source of this horrific evil. People, broken and evil people, use their power over others to harm them, and they are not thinking of their victims, only their need and their illness. Now, I'm not a trained counselor who can explain why these serial assaulters continue to commit the crimes, but we want to take some time to talk about how churches and pastors can protect themselves from sexual abuse and misconduct in the church. Um, Child molesters, that's one thing that is, for me, is just hard to stomach and just put my, my, my mind around, uh, uh, but they are also children of God, no matter how difficult or, or angry I might be at, at them and difficult to say, but they are children of God and they need to be forgiven and loved. But they also must never be a child ever again, period. Keep them safe in the church. Keep them, yes, uh, safe in the church, um, to protect children and to help them, uh, with their, with their demons. Um, that's why they should never be around them. Uh, those boundaries have to be there. We have safe sanctuaries and background checks for all staff and volunteers with children to help ensure the safety of all children. And if you're not doing that in your local church, you have to do that. I don't care if great aunt Edna is, is taking care of the kids. If she is in the nursery and you're going to take care of the kids and one-on-one with them, she has to have a background check. And now when it comes to, to sexual abuse between adults in the church, I think you first have to have a realistic understanding of yourself, uh, not an inflated view or think that you're uh, without fault or superman or superwoman. You have to have a realistic understanding of yourself, you as a human being. Uh, You will, the fact is, is that as a human being, as a sexual human being, you're going to find yourself attracted to other people. Uh, That's human nature, and that's biology. But just because you are attracted to someone doesn't mean you have to act on it. Uh, In fact, if you find yourself attracted to someone, uh, you have to set up boundaries when it comes to that particular person. Uh, Don't be alone with them. Uh, Don't try to hug them uh, or take them out for breakfast or lunch or meet with them uh, all the time on a consistent basis. Keep it strictly professional. Your interactions are strictly 
professional. And you can have a professional relationship as a pastor with a parishioner. You can pray with someone you are attracted to, but you don't have to hold their hand or stare in their eyes or uh, be behind locked doors. Yeah. I remember during a sexual ethics training that we took at seminary and in two trainings that we've had since in the United Methodist Church, um, they talk about what leads pastors to sexual indiscretion in the church. And there are a few factors, right? Newsweek had an article in November of 2017 that shared research from MIT showing that when we are stressed out, we make riskier perhaps stupider decisions. Um, so you're, you're just not thinking straight. So cheating on your wife with the church secretary sounded like a horrible idea on your first day there, but uh, five years later with stress at home, with meetings, with kids, with committees, with pastoral care, it doesn't seem that crazy anymore. You can rationalize your thing, to, you rationalize to do anything. Yeah, so ministry can be an isolating place. If you don't have a support network, you can find yourself crumbling pretty quickly. If you're in any kind of high risk job where you don't really feel like you have people to talk to, you can fall victim in these same ways. Also, this is unfortunate, but but true. Pastors can have an overinflated sense of their spiritual strength. So they don't think they need commonplace boundaries like um uh, like not meeting someone of the opposite sex in private, right? You don't like if no one is at the church, I'm not going to meet uh, some of the opposite sex there for counseling. Even if there is a window in the door, if there's no one else in the church, we'll go to a coffee shop or take a walk, be out in public somewhere. Um, or, you know, everyone should put firewalls on your computer against porn or don't text or call a parishioner about personal issues on a daily basis when you have a spouse or a mentor or a counselor to turn to for advice. We blur lines pretty quickly and we find ourselves uh, in danger. Anyone can, right? So Brandon and I have always like shared our calendars with each other so we know who's meeting with whom, when and where. Uh, and if either of us picks up on some inappropriate feelings coming towards our spouse from a church member, we set up tighter boundaries. And in some cases, I think just like once or twice, we've had to lovingly confront the person. You know, I know you're going through a really difficult time, a really difficult divorce. We want to be here for you. We love you and care about you. Um, if it's a woman, then I'll offer to counsel the woman. If it's a man, then Brandon will offer to counsel the man just to help make sure that this person in this emotional, vulnerable state doesn't read into um, the concern of a pastor. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've covered a lot of territory uh, here, and now we want to take <clears throat> some of your questions. So let's see what we have. Um, and what does uh, the we have book one. of discipline have to say about sexual indiscretions for pastors? Ooh, Lauren, that's a great question. Uh, so there is, you can read through the book of discipline. There's a policy in place. If you think that your pastor has overstepped their bounds mm. sexually, uh, then you would report it uh, to staff parish uh, and or the district superintendent. Mm -hmm. And then there is a clear, <clears throat> fair system whereby, you know, they gather evidence, see if this is actually a valid claim. If so, then depending on what they've done, you know, looking at porn mm -hmm. on a church office computer or sleeping with a secret secretary, if there's an, if there's an affair that has happened, um, then the pastor or, um, just hitting on or sexual uh, harassment, so, or yeah, I sexual mean, harassment. Yeah. there's, um, you know, there have been Methodist that, pastors that yeah. go to jail too. I mean, you can yeah. be kicked out of the church and, and depending mm -hmm. on what you've done, imprisoned, and then it just causes so much harm for the whole community. Yeah. But um, but it's a fair process. So yes, there are penalties and punishments. And they do require every four years we take a, a sexual ethics training mm -hmm. just to make sure we know what's appropriate and what's not. Um, they even advise in the training that if you're a single pastor, you know, you're not married, that you don't date anyone from your congregation either because you're their pastor and not their boyfriend or girlfriend, which can make it really hard and put a lot of pressure on um, single clergy as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say uh, contact the uh, chair of SPRC first um, mm -hmm. and, and also the district superintendent and make sure you find uh, file a, um, a an official complaint, uh, official report uh, for um, uh, sexual uh, assault, abuse, um, inappropriate behavior. Um, so. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that, you know, you can be uh, have your 
I'm pretty sure if our DS Wayne is watching us tonight, he'll know. Uh, I think you can be uh, have your ordination uh, uh, mm -hmm. removed uh, for those uh, for those offenses. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I got another well, question up here. Ask us anything. Uh, there was a delegate at General Conference who alluded to sexism being a reason female pastors were not being promoted to higher levels of the UMC clergy. What is the church actively doing to investigate this or change it? Ha, ha, ha. Yep, that would be pretty true. I mean, it is hard statistically for women to, there are not as many females leading large mm -hmm. churches in any conference as men. And the pay for women is, is grossly still... unproportionate to men. Yep. Uh, for also minorities uh, is grossly mm -hmm. proportionate to white males. Yeah. So, and the Methodist church is, they realize it's a problem. Uh, there for women specifically, there, there's a group called, um, the committee, uh, Costco that does research every year and investigates pay and how many women are being promoted. So I know in the Virginia they are more actively trying to give women equal opportunities, but they still have a, ways to go. Slowly mm -hmm. and steadily, they're working towards it. Our Bishop Lewis is really committed to that, being an African-American female. She knows and has lived that journey herself. Um, so she, she's she been a really positive influence on our conference. But I, I can post when we're done. I'll put other books and resources you can read about how this is a problem for women. And, you know, when I was doing my internship at uh, Duke, there was a male mentor supervisor over me that was being inappropriate. Like when we first met, he put his hand on my upper thigh and I went to report it and I was told, oh honey, don't start problems now. Like just just let him be because you don't wanna be known as that whistleblower before you even begin your ministry. And so something that we can all do at the church is listen and take those reports and seriously. Um, so I, I took care of the problem myself. You know, I. I told him I'd taken my self-defense classes and could kill him 30 different ways with whatever was in my purse if he felt the need to touch my body like that again. And he didn't. And so it was a, you know, I, I survived that experience. But but we need to do a better job in the church of really listening to people's stories and seeing if they're they're true and, and, and honest, but also um, being empathetic with the pain that this has caused for so many people who have been mistreated. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing issue. Any other questions? Let me pull it up. I don't see any popping up now. We still have eight minutes, but if you have any questions that come up between now and the start of our Lenten series, you can go ahead and post those. We'll try to be better about doing polls uh, so that you can engage even prior to the start of our next Crowdcast webinar. But we hope this has been helpful for you. It's been hard some weeks to um, just... I don't know, but address these issues, honestly, but we hope it's been helpful and we're honored mm -hmm. to have been a part of journeying through sexuality in the church together. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. Any final thoughts or words? I just want to thank everybody for being understanding me being away last week, uh, being with uh, my family at the, at the passing of my father. Um, really wanted to be there to talk about, um, homosexuality, especially in the church, especially leading up to uh, General Conference's decision on uh, Tuesday. Um, I think Rachel and mm -hmm. I are very disappointed in um, the decision. Um, mm -hmm. We really wish the one church plan uh, would have passed. Um, so uh, we are just... Um, I know at the gathering, we'll be talking about it briefly on Sunday, you know, what's next for us moving forward. Uh, but the truth is God is still on the throne. The kingdom of God is still being built here on earth by incredible disciples trying to love mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> be the light of Christ in a world that feels a lot darker some days than on others. So um, thank you guys for being our light in this process. And, uh, and we will get through this together. So mm -hmm. yeah, more updates coming about the whole general conference thing. So make sure you see the Bishop's live stream on Monday morning with her update. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, have a wonderful evening guys. Thank you for everything. Yeah. And, um, and uh, again, don't, uh, next week, uh, we will take a week off. Um, Rachel is doing a uh, speaking in Orlando, and I am home with the kids. Uh, so 
Uh, pizza delivery. Uh, You're so bad. We will survive. Dodgeball tag with the kids because mom's gone. So we will catch you back here in two weeks. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Yeah.